So in this lesson, we're going to look at no-shift sentences. So what is a no-shift sentence in GRE text completion? A no-shift sentence is a sentence where there is no change in meaning or mood. So you're going to have similar connotation and similar meaning between one part of a sentence and another part of a sentence. In other words, no-shift sentences are very straightforward. They have this main idea or message, and all the other ideas in the sentence directly support that. You're not going to see the introduction of any sort of contrast or any sort of apparent contradiction in a no-shift sentence. So I briefly told you what a no-shift sentence is, but it's actually easier to define no-shift sentences in terms of what they aren't. So, no-shift sentences are the opposite of shift sentences, which are also a very important sentence type in GRE text completion. Shift sentences contain words that indicate that there will be a contrast or a contradiction. So let me give you an example. Let's see this example shift sentence. Though she was talkative in public, she was known to be quiet and reserved in private. And you see though, this underlined word, though indicates that we're going to introduce a contrast or contradiction, that although one thing is true, another thing that's a little different is also true. Okay, so through that, we can see what a no-shift sentence is. Here's the no-shift equivalent. Uh, because she was talkative in public, she was assumed to be outgoing and friendly in private as well. And there we see some strong signal words where because indicates that straightforward cause and effect that you'll see in a straightforward no-shift sentence, as well indicates a sort of also where you're adding more ideas that are similar. Um, so now let's look at an example no-shift sentence with that in mind where the signal words are weak. So we had strong signal words here. We're going to go down to weak ones. And here um, we have she was talkative in public and outgoing and friendly in private. So sometimes a no-shift signal word on the GRE will be as simple as just and, where they're just adding a similar idea. More often, though, you will see these stronger signal words. At this point, let's take a closer look at no shift words and phrases. So first look at these first several words and phrases that I'm circling. These are fairly simple and straightforward. If you see these words in a sentence and there aren't any obvious words that would indicate a shift or contradiction, you're probably dealing with a no shift sentence. We also have these interesting words because when we deal with something like not only, but also, or just as, so too, we're dealing with a larger pattern of words that will contain words that don't shift. So for example, you could say, not only is this good, but also it's great. Good and great, no shift there. Or just as the weather was very wet today, so too will it rain tomorrow. Wet weather, it'll rain. Again, we have that lack of shift. So we do have no shift patterns as well as words and phrases. And above all, remember that there are many, many other possible no-shift words and phrases. Always double-check the meaning of the words in the sentence. Make sure you are indeed dealing with no-shift. So let's look at a simple example no-shift sentence. And as I've indicated here on the slide, this is not quite GRE-like. It follows the GRE concepts of no-shift, but on the real exam, you'll never see a text completion quite this simple. So the meal was blank and it was quite insufficient. Let's look at our answer choices. Tepid. Tepid means of a lukewarm temperature, not too hot, not too cold, in a way that could be unpleasant in the mouth. And you might be a little tempted to latch on to tepid because insufficient, well, it seems a little bit negative. Like if something's insufficient, it's bad. If it's tepid, it's bad. So we're going to mark that as a possibility. So maybe tepid. But let's see if we can have something even more similar. So the meal was substantial and it was quite insufficient. Well, substantial means large or it means enough. So here we actually have an opposite. And because this is no shift, we don't want an opposite from insufficient. So substantial is out. Minimal. Okay, if something's minimal, there's not much of it. And that is a really close match for insufficient. Closer than tepid, really, because tepid is about temperature, whereas insufficient minimal are about quantity. So probably minimal is correct. But let's look at this. The meal was prepared, and it was quite insufficient. Well, that's interesting, because you can prepare a meal that's insufficient. There's not really a contradiction there, but there's not this marked similarity. Prepared is very neutral. You can prepare a meal that's sufficient. You can prepare a meal that's insufficient. So we're going to mark off prepared just as we marked off 
substantial. The meal was abandoned and it was quite insufficient. Well, that might make a little bit of logical sense where somebody says, this is so little food, I'm not even interested in eating it. But abandoned, again, is kind of neutral. You could abandon a sufficient meal because you have to run out of the house. You could abandon an insufficient meal because you're not interested in it. That, again, is a bit too neutral. And what you want to notice here is that in general for no shift sentences, the right answer, and I think at this point we can really settle on C as the right answer because it's so much closer to insufficient than tepid was, but the correct answer will create a very distinct um, similarity and it will index the greatest similarity. Tepid is slightly similar, minimal is more similar, so it's a better answer. The wrong answers could create a contradiction, and we see that in B, or they could simply be neutral. Um, and we see that here. So, again, you want to avoid contradictions, you want to avoid neutrality, you want to avoid insufficient similarity, and you want to come up with the answer that gives you the greatest similarity. So, with that in mind, let's take a closer look at some real actual questions here. And before we get to those real examples, those real GRE-like questions, we should do a quick refresher on what makes no shift the way it is and those signal words. Okay, so let's look at the same sentence where before we had the meal was minimal and it was quite insufficient. Let's look at the same example of stronger signal words like you might see on the real GRE. Given that the meal was minimal, it was quite insufficient, as could be expected. And you're going to generally get this uh, strong, uh, these strong context clues on the GRE. Occasionally you see just a basic uh, no shift signal word like and, but usually you'll see something stronger here. And again, remember to think of no shift and the way no shift works in terms of it not being shift. So here's what a shift sentence might look like. The meal was large, but in spite of this, so we have a shift signal word, it was quite insufficient. So you want to make sure you are distinguishing between shift and no shift. And now we are going to go to those real examples. Uh, well, relatively real. They're taken from Magoosh GRE, which is very similar to the real exam. So here's our first practice question. And notice at the bottom of the screen, I've given you some hints just to remember for getting the correct answer and avoiding those wrong answers. So that should get you on your way along with what you've learned so far. So take a look at this. See if you can answer the question and then we'll talk about this. So pause the video, do the question, and we will discuss it. Welcome back. Let's go over this question. So we have some of today's tech CEOs are spoken of in the press and on social media in such blank terms that they have taken on nearly messianic quality, entrepreneurs following their every move like a gaggle of disciples. Okay, so we have an absence of shift words and we have a comma, and sometimes a comma can be a subtle uh, hint at a lack of shift, where you have a statement and then just a comma and a phrase. Often a comma will just introduce a phrase that adds extra ideas. Okay, so we have entrepreneurs following the every move like disciples. So they're kind of worshiping those CEOs. And sure enough, jump back, you have the idea of a messianic quality. A, a messiah is a powerful religious leader. So since there's clearly no shift, what we want to do is we want to look for a word that matches the things that come later in the sentence. So let's take a look at this. Thoughtful. Well, certainly you can be thinking a lot about a person if you're worshiping them or if you're really looking up to them, but you can be thoughtful about a lot of things. Thoughtful is kind of neutral. You can be thoughtful about somebody you look down on. Like, oh, I think this person is a little below me, but I want to be thoughtful and make sure I'm guiding them correctly. So thoughtful, way too neutral. Hushed. Well, that's interesting because if you're really in awe of somebody, maybe you're quiet when you're around them. But if you're really in awe of someone, perhaps you're also really loud. Like, hey, you're so wonderful. Tell me things. So hushed. It's not clearly contra it's not clearly contrasting or similar. We have another issue where things are kind of a little bit neutral. Okay, reverential. Well, if you're reverential, it means you have reverence for somebody. It means you have deep respect. A deep respect that is religious or is almost religious. So that's certainly a possibility. 
ambivalent. If you're ambivalent about someone, ambivalent about a CEO, it means you're not sure if they're good or bad and you feel maybe a little uneasy. So ambivalent is having a negative feeling rather than a worshipful, worshipful feeling. So that would be a shift in meaning from ambivalent to something more worshipful, worshipful messianic, or disciple-like. So that's actually creating a contrast where there shouldn't be one. Persistent. If you're talking about somebody in a persistent tone, you're saying, no, you really should listen to me. I need to keep saying this. That's neutral. You could be persistently saying that somebody is messianic. You could be persistently saying they're, uh, that you're their disciple. Or you could uh, be persistently saying, oh, this is an ordinary person or something like that. So that's neutral. And uh, C is the correct answer. And remember, C creates and indicates this distinct similarity between ideas. The wrong answers are neutral, contrasting, or not sufficiently clearly similar. I think now we're ready to move on to a double blank no shift sentence. So take a close look at this, see if you can come up with the answers. Pause the video, answer the question, and we'll talk about this. Right, so let's break this down. The first thing I want to point out to you is uh, that there are a few keywords that indicate this is no shift. So tantamount to, tantamount to means the same as. So if something is the same as something else, that indicates a lack of shift, that we're going to compare two similar things. And then of course we have a keyword I've mentioned before earlier in this lesson, indeed. Indeed generally is used to set up an example or something that furthers one idea with a similar supporting idea. So we should know that's no shift from that. Okay, so let's see what the sentence says and what the correct answers are. In conservative scientific circles, embracing an unorthodox theory, especially one that is backed up by little, uh, little empirical evidence, is tantamount to, is the same thing as blank. Indeed, any scientist who does so may be blank. Well, let's look at that first blank. So, we need a word that's similar to something else. What is it similar to? Well, embracing an unorthodox theory is similar to something else. So, unorthodox, what does that mean? That means not following rules, not following tradition. And in some cases, it can also mean not following religious faith. So, we should zero in on heresy as an obvious likely answer here. Because heresy means not following tradition in a way that's so strong that you'll get punished for it in some way. Uh, now we, let's look at the other words though, just to be sure. Eccentricity. Eccentricity means, it can mean being a little unconventional, but it really means just behaving in a way that's somewhat different from ex than expected. And it's actually possible to be eccentric and to be traditional. You could be so much more traditional than everybody else, so much more orthodox than everybody else around you that you seem to be behaving in a way that's unexpected. So eccentricity, it could be different from, uh, it could be different from orthodox, it could mean unorthodox, but it might not. So it's either neutral or a little bit ambiguous. Reversion. Well, reversion means going back to the way things were done. And if you're unorthodox, you're not doing things the way they used to be done. So reversion actually creates a contrast or a shift where there shouldn't be one. So heresy is definitely it. And that's kind of helpful because if you're looking at something in terms of heresy, then you want to find out what happens to the scientists who commit this heresy, this thing that's basically a crime against tradition. Well, remember, if you commit a crime, you might be punished. So ostracized, which means deliberately treated badly by a group of people, shut out of your own group of people because they're punishing you. Well, that seems like a distinct possibility. But let's look at the other ones. Lionized. If you lionize someone, you, you hold them up as a hero or an example. So there's a shift or a contrast, but this is no shift. So we don't want that. Because if you're lionizing somebody, you're certainly not recognizing that they've committed a crime, then you wouldn't hold them up as a hero or an example. Vanquished. Well, vanquished, it's, it's definitely negative. It's something bad that could happen, but vanquishment isn't really punishment. It's defeat in battle. And right here in this no shift sentence, we're using a religious metaphor to refer to science, not a war metaphor to refer to science. So vanquish is a little too far away. It doesn't indicate punishment for heresy. If somebody's committed a crime, you don't do battle with them. You simply punish them within the order of rules that you have. So vanquished 
just doesn't create enough of a similarity in terms of mood and themes in the sentence. So the answers are indeed C and F. And again, the other answers just they don't create enough of a similarity or they create a contrast where there shouldn't be one or the answers are neutral. Now that we've gone through this lesson and done a few practice questions, you should have some big ideas in your head. Let's review them though. So big idea number one. No shift sentences are marked by a number of words and phrases. Uh, among them, and, also, because, every bit as, indeed, and of course idiomatic patterns we discussed before like not only and but also. Big idea number two. Watching for no shift words is certainly important, but you also want to watch for the absence of contrasting shift words. Remember, no shift sentences are defined partially, uh, partly as not being shift sentences. Big idea number three, look for answer choices that create similarity. You're not looking for answer choices that are, very, that are merely neutral, and you certainly want to avoid answer choices that create a contrast, because if you create a contrast here, then you're actually dealing with a shift sentence rather than a no shift sentence. Big idea number four, choose answers that create the correct level of similarity. So if you're down to two answers and one answer seems to be arguably setting up similarity, but another answer makes a couple of things very clearly similar in the sentence. You want to have the best highest level of similarity possible when you're finding that proper no shift word to fill in the blank in a no shift sentence. And finally, uh, remember that you also want to be aware of shift sentences. So be sure to watch our intro to sentence shift video lesson because it's a companion to this one and helps bring no shift sentences into full focus. Okay, in this video lesson, we're gonna talk about a special kind of text completion. It is called the cause and effect. Cause and effect text completion. How do we know we're dealing with a cause and effect text completion? Well, we have these keywords here for cause and effect. We have because, which you'll see, uh-huh, in this sentence, or given that, as a result of, since, therefore, consequently, all of these. Get used to them because these are relatively common on the GRE or the GRE text completion. So, here we have it. Because the corporation has been suffering four consecutive years of losses, it is blank to begin hiring again. So as a result of the company doing bad, I'm just kind of breaking down the sentence here. If I'm looking for the keywords, it has been suffering. It is blank to begin hiring again. Well, it is unlikely that it will begin hiring again. So we can get rid of words like eager, reluctant. If you're reluctant, you're not really willing to do something. So that works pretty well. Inclined is the opposite. Dispose is actually a synonym here for inclined, so we can get rid of both of them. Ambivalent means you have mixed feelings. So someone would maybe kind of argue for this word, but this word is a little bit more complex. You're both positive and negative here. That wasn't our word saying, oh, well, they're ambivalent because, you know, they're, they're confident or hopeful in one manner, but kind of unhopeful in another. You see, that's a complex word. It requires a complex clue not going on there. So again, key here, of course, is identifying cause and effect sentence with words like because, and then just following the usual steps, break down the sentence, looking for the keyword, and coming up with our own word. So let's try another one, a longer one, as you can see. Cornelius was prone to embellish whenever possible. In some cases, he would even twist reality if it served his theatrical aims. Consequently, therefore, his colleagues did not blank his account of the flying saucer-shaped cloud that followed him all the way from his home to the office. Okay, rather comical one, but there's a lot of verbiage going on here. So he was basically like to exaggerate. That's all that means. And so I'm, I'm getting rid of this. This is my cutting through the verbiage up here. So he would twist reality and therefore his colleagues did not believe his account. That's all. So he's prone to you know, making stuff up. And just like that, we need a word that means believe. And oh, look, well, there it is, that easy. We, again, we noted the word consequently. We went through, we put in our own word and we got it that quickly. Mistrust, obviously the opposite, the ride put down does not work here. Reject his account. They did reject his account, but look at that keyword right there, not, not believe. So always make sure you put in our own word, celebrate doesn't make sense, of course. And there we have an answer. So you can see typically cause and effect sentences aren't the more difficult ones. This one was of course very easy. However, they're sometimes difficult 
text completions, whether single or double, triple blank, that deal with cause and effect structures, such as this one. A theoretical physicist, especially one trying to divine the origins of the universe, I kind of call this a little bit of verbiage, just get rid of it, must rely on mathematical training just as much as, that's a, actually an interesting construction now that we're here, it doesn't really have to do with cause and effect sentences, but the structure, mathematical training just as much as, mathematical training of course being A, just as much as whatever goes in here B, shows that they are equal. So mathematical training is just as important as something else. What is this something else? Notice the word for, it's a small word, it's not big like consequently or therefore, but there it is, that shows that we are dealing with a cause and effect sentence. And so now we want to just do, do our usual, follow our basic steps, find the clue, keywords, come up with our own word. The mind must be able to concoct, to come up with endless possible scenarios. So have to think of all these different possible things. So is that intuition? Well, you could argue that perhaps to come up with these multiple scenarios, you need intuition, but it doesn't really mean, in and of itself, intuition doesn't mean the ability to concoct or come up with endless possible scenarios. So it's kind of, but not really. Hindsight is a trap here because you're thinking, oh, the divine the origins of the universe, you have to look back. But here you just want a word that means being able to come up with many different ideas. Speaking of which, coming up with many different ideas, there it is, you need to be creative. Logic, another trap answer because math is involved, you know, math and logic. But again, this is our, these are our keywords here. We want to match that up, of course, with the answer. The way you do with creativity, irrationality clearly doesn't work. And there's the answer C. So after a while, when doing these, you'll, you'll notice this cause and effect relationship because you'll pick up on these keywords. And of course, it's just a, a matter of always following the basic steps so you can get the answer correct. Okay, in this video, we are going to be dealing with a type of sentence called elaboration sentences. In elaboration sentences, you will often see here the semicolon, you will sometimes see a dash, and you'll sometimes see a colon. And let's get that right here in front of us. Boom. You'll see these three. I drew them roughly up here. And it's important because these, te these types of text completions are very common on the GRE, so it's important to know that more or less these three are used interchangeably. What are they elaborating? What's going on? Well, David's reputation as a blank was well deserved. Tell us more, elaborate. So we get our semicolon. We have a word like indeed. Indeed is, again, a word that show, shows us we're going in the same direction. There's no shift, so it's simply elaborating. So note indeed, and then elaborating how? Well, the sentence says, even after coming into a million dollar inheritance, he, stepping David, still lived in a poorly furnished attic. Huh. So what kind of word do we need to come up with? Well, this person had all this money, million dollar inheritance, and they still live very poorly. So again, we want to come up with our own word and match. And maybe right off the bat, you know that a, the word for someone who has a lot of money but doesn't spend even a single penny is a miser. You may, though, have been trapped by the word pauper. A pauper is simply a poor person. David, however, lives like a poor person, but is actually rich. So we get rid of that. Clearly not optimistic. Opportunistic, he's not that either. That means you know, I'm trying to always seize the opportunity. And then finally, we have this fun word here, curmudgeon. We don't need, of course, need to pick it because curmudgeon, or because we have our answer, C miser, but curmudgeon means somebody who is grumpy. So again, we can get rid of it. But again, we're following the basic steps Again, though, you want to identify the sentence. Notice, is it shift or no shift? Now, we can have an elaboration sentence, however, that does shift. However, with a word like indeed, it doesn't shift. So that's also important to note. But the idea here is if you want to know well, what's the answer to the blank, you look after the semicolon or the colon or the hyphen, and there you will find the elaboration. So let's have a look. There is another one with a hyphen. Carla approach work in a blank manner. Hmm, how does she approach it? Well, let's read after the hyphen. She would often stare vacantly into nothingness while performing a given task, regarding it as nothing more than a chore. Okay, huh. Well, she obviously doesn't like work, so again, we first looked at the second part of the sentence and thought, huh, how is it defining this? And she doesn't like her work, so what sort of manner? How does she approach work? Well, we come up here with our own word, and it's 
kind of in a very blah manner or routine. Now, yes, blah is obviously slang, but that's fine. You're coming up with your own word, your own sense. It doesn't have to even really be a dictionary word. If you think, well, she must have a very blah approach to work or very routine as though she would rather be doing anything else. So now we can go through the answer choices. And again, here's steadfast, which means loyal. That doesn't mean blah. If you're a steadfast worker, you stick to the task. Roundabout, you're just not direct. Perfunctory, hmm, word probably don't know. Unseemly, this is a popular GRE word. It means something that is not appropriate. So it has a very negative connotation as well. So it's almost immoral, it's unseemly, it's improper, but she's simply really out to lunch when it comes to work. Without literally being out to lunch, she's simply treating work in a very blah manner. Then there's brusque. Brusque means rude. So that doesn't work. And you can see the word that we don't know in this case is the answer, which is perfunctory. And perfunctory, when you do something in a perfunctory manner, you go through the motions. You don't really put any thought or heart into it. You simply do it in a very routine fashion. So again, though, the key here was noticing the hyphen, noticing that we're dealing with an elaboration sentence. In this case, there's no shift. We're simply defining the word perfunctory using this example of this woman here at work. Okay, in this video, we're going to be dealing with a sentence where there definitely isn't a shift, and there's a similarity that it's important to note. This is called an apposition, where you have two words that are next to each other. In this case, we have pointed, even, blank. And so when you're dealing with these two words that are next to each other, they usually tend to be adjectives. Again, they follow one another. It's called apposition. And, you know, of course, you don't have to know that. But what you do know is that the second word here, in the, blank, the blank itself, is going to be similar to pointed, but it's also going to be more extreme because of that word even. Sometimes that word will be there, other times it doesn't, it won't be there. And in that case, pointed, this word here would probably be more of a synonym. But now with even, we're looking for a more extreme word. So let's read the sentence. As she enumerated the current administration's shortcomings, her editorial became pointed, even blank, as it skewered the government for its many ineptitudes. This sentence is a little bit harder than the other one. Part of the reason why is the words enumerated. Enumerated means to list out one by one. Again, you don't really have to know this for this to get the sentence right, because all you really need to know is this word here, pointed. And if a criticism is pointed, it's definitely exact, and it's marked by the person speaking in such a way where they want the other person to know that, hey, you're being criticized. My criticism is pointed, but we want to take it even further. And that's why we need a word that's even more than just overtly critical. We want something like, okay. I am upset with you, government, you, government full of your ineptitudes or, and shortcomings. And again, if someone is inept or is filled with ineptitudes, they're no good at what they do. So what's that word? That's a more extreme version of pointed. Well, let's look at muted. Muted, again, of course, we want to make sure here that the words are similar and related. Muted is the opposite. You're quiet in your criticism. Charitable, you're kind. That's definitely the opposite of what's going on as well. Abstract, you're vague. Polemical, hmm, mystery word. Uncertain, while well, she was pointed, she was pretty certain about how she was criticizing her. So we need an even more extreme word. That's not going to work. And again, you see that word you don't know is the answer. A polemic. A polemic is an impassioned, argumentative attack on something, usually. And in this case, the polemical is the adjective form of polemic, or polemics, would be a, which would be a noun. And here, the controversy, of course, is the government and its ineptitudes. And this person is speaking out in a harsh way against the government. And that word is polemical. And that's how the sentence functions. So the good news is, is if you know this word, you know the apposition, the even, some sort of extreme. You don't have to know all, this, all these other words. You really don't even have to know what the sentence is saying. You could still get the answer. So that can definitely be helpful on some of these text completions.